Hello, 3ABN family, God's family. We're glad you're here as we're studying together on the Sabbath school lesson on the book of John. We're on the fourth week, which is the witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. I am Daniel Perrin, and we are, we're working our way through the lessons that are not chapter by chapter, but you'll notice it has been thematically going from theme to theme, and this week we're looking at the witnesses. Well, I'm not the only one presenting here. We have got several students of God's word. They are fellow students with you, and I'd like to, share, to introduce them to you. Right on my left, we have Shelley Quinn. Oh, it's such a joy to be here. Thank you for joining us, and I'm excited. Monday's lesson is the Lamb of God. I'm excited as well. And then we have next in line, Brother Ryan Day. Amen. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled, The Two Disciples of John. And then moving on to Wednesday, the next witnesses of Christ shared by Pastor John Dinsey. It's a blessing to be here. John is one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. I have Wednesday, Philip and Nathaniel. And then finally, Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Daniel. On Thursday, we look at the witness of Nicodemus. The witness of Nicodemus. So as you can see, we've got a number of witnesses of Christ as the Messiah for today. Now, if you're interested in receiving the notes that we use as we study and present, you can go to 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. You'll find a little tab somewhere on that page that says notes. Enter your information and you will be set to receive those notes each week. Well, before we begin our study today, I'd like to ask uh, Jill if you'd be willing to pray for us. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of your word and for the gift of the Holy Spirit that opens up our minds and hearts to understand and receive. Right now as we study, we ask that you would reveal to us how we can be a better witness for you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'll be sharing Sunday's lesson, which is the testimony of John the Baptist. Now, the memory text for this week is John 3, 3, which doesn't deal with John the Baptist, but it'll prepare us for where we're going in this lesson. And this memory text is a promise. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'm thankful for that promise that Jesus gives in God's word. Now, the title of this lesson, Jesus, uh, Witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. The word witnesses shows up first in the Gospel of John in chapter 1, verse 7. And that witness is talking about John the Baptist. It says, this man came for a witness to bear witness. So you have both, uh, well, he's the witness and he's giving a witness. To bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Now that Greek word witness is from, or that word witness is from the Greek word martus. Mm -hmm. The idea yeah. is of giving a first-hand testimony That's of right. something you've actually experienced and been in contact with. That's right. That word martus in Greek is where we get the English word martyr. And there's no, no more compelling way to say, I have witnessed something than to say, I'm willing to lay down my life for it. And so that's a martyr. It's a witness. And John the Baptist certainly was one of those. A witness is in line with the theme of John's gospel that we've referenced, and I, I think in almost every lesson so far in John 20, 31, where John says, these things are written that you may believe. And so a witness leads you then, helps to give evidence to you so that you can have a faith, a belief in Jesus. The question is this, how many witnesses are we going to need? How many witnesses do you require? Some people are never convinced, especially when they're looking at biblical topics where the evidence is laid out for them in God's word. And they say, no, I'm still not sure about that. Is that you? Are you always waiting for a clincher argument, always holding out to say, no, I, I want a little more evidence until then I'm convinced, I, I'm, I'm content to be a skeptic. Well, through the witnesses that John lays out here, he's inviting you as well as me and others to take a look at the evidence that God has laid out for you because God knows what is required. God knows the evidence it takes and he says, I'm gonna give you all that you need. Sabbath's lesson points out that the evidence in John's gospel comes from Jews and Gentiles, hmm. rich and poor, male and female, rulers and commoners, as well as the educated and the uneducated. Evidence is coming from witnesses from all sides. 
Starting here in lesson four, there are actually five weeks, five uh, weekly lessons that are going to focus on witnesses of the Messiah, of Christ. We have John the Baptist in this lesson, Andrew and Simon Peter, mm -hmm. Philip and Nathaniel, Nicodemus, the Samaritans, there will be the witness of the Father, mm -hmm. the witness of the crowd, Mary who anoints Jesus' feet, and then unexpectedly the witness from Pilate, <laughs> the witness of Thomas, and even other witnesses that come before Christ through the Old Testament scriptures. The lesson even points to all the miracles of Jesus that are called signs. Samion is the Greek word, something that turns the attention to something, that they're also witnesses pointing to Jesus. We have the witnesses of those who've come before us. Uh, Hebrews 11 is a perfect example of that. Look what others have believed, giving you a foundation to believe. And then we have our own witness, which is the experience we have with God. It's a witness that, that uh, is compelling to us and also a witness we share with others. So God is essentially saying here, I've given you everything that you need to believe. Will you examine it? Will you make a decision? John chapter 1 verses 19 to 23 tells the story of the testimony of John the Baptist. Now John's not a side character in the book of John. John the Baptist isn't. He's actually mentioned right here in the prologue in verse 6 and 7 where we're introduced to Jesus as the Word and as the light. You have this character that has been prepared by God. He's been planned for. He's a part of Bible prophecy. He's a pivotal, essential part of pointing to Jesus. And he comes before Jesus is baptized. You have John the Baptist. And so we find him in verse, uh, verse 6 and 7 where it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So John, the gospel writer, counts on the fact that we will already be familiar with who John the Baptist is and the fact that he quickly drew people from Judea to, to, uh, to come out and listen to him preach and have their hearts changed and, and focus on repentance and confession and that the, the Jewish priests and leaders were also interested in John, figuring out who he was. Because the gospel writer doesn't give us history on John the Baptist, he just presents us as a part of God's, uh, presents him to us as a part of God's plan. And so along come the Jewish leaders and they want to know about John. Who are you? Who are you? And behind that, of course, is what gives you the right? What gives you the authority? Everybody's listening to you. They're not coming to hear us anymore. They're all out here gathering. Who are you? And John's immediate answer tells them exactly who he's not. He says, I'm not the Christ. If, if that's what you're wondering, that's not who I am. And so they, then they ask, are you Elijah? Are you Elijah, the one who has promised? Malachi had promised, the prophet Malachi had promised that Elijah is going to come back. Now, not in person, but someone in the spirit and power of Elijah. In other words, these Pharisees and Jewish leaders, they had been studying the prophecies. Mm -hmm. They knew what was predicted. John the Baptist immediately responds, no, I'm not Elijah. So then are you the prophet who Moses predicted? More prophecy that they're referring to. And John the Baptist immediately says, no, I'm not that prophet. I want you to notice that the Levites and the priests, they had been studying Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. But as we find out, they're really not tuned in to looking for how the Bible prophecies are going to change their life. They're not looking at them with the attitude of being drawn to Jesus. And this is a reminder to us because we focus on studying Bible prophecy. We can do it in such a way that will not lead to Jesus, but will just give us more information. We want a glad willingness to follow him, not just knowledge. And that following him, especially when it's difficult and it cuts across the habits and the desires of our heart. And so they're asking again, who are you? And John takes them back to a misunderstood Bible prophecy. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. This is a picture of clearing out a path for the king's chariot to travel down smoothly so it's easy to get where they're going. John the Baptist's purpose is to make it easy for people to accept Jesus, to prepare their hearts and minds. And he does exactly what we should do. Two things, he says, 
look at what the Bible says. And so he quotes from uh, the scripture, Isaiah chapter 40, verse three. And number two, he turns all attention to Jesus. None for him. He doesn't need any compliments. He needs people to look, for, look at Jesus. He doesn't need people to say, nice sermon. He wants people to have their hearts and lives changed. He does not need, he does not desire anybody's praise. He simply wants them to say, yes, I will let the Lord change my life. And this is an important point for each of us. And I'm going to share two quotations right here because pastors and teachers, we don't need compliments. We need people to look to Jesus. And here's the first statement I'm going to share with you. Do not flatter or extol your minister, telling him what a fine discourse he has preached. Let him stand in his position as Christ's ambassador. Listen to his words as to one sent from God. Heed his, his instructions and show by your life that you have heard to some purpose. And as a humble Christian, without any parade, let the minister fulfill his duties. That's written in Signs of the Times, January 27, 1890. And this is such an important point that I'm going to share one more statement here from uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 474. Ellen White writes here, she says, I lift my voice of warning against praising or flattering the ministers. I've seen the evil, the dreadful evil of this. Never, never speak a word of praise in praise of ministers to their faces. Exalt God. Ever respect a faithful minister, realize his burdens, and lighten them if you can, but do not flatter him, for Satan stands ready at his watchtower to do that kind of work himself. So we don't want to be involved in the work of Satan, lifting up the messenger. Instead, we want to be lifting up Christ. And John exemplifies this when you get to chapter 3, verse 30, where he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And that's our prayer that Jesus Christ be lifted up. So let's look at what this witness of John was in the last minute I have here in verse 29. John says plainly, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me because he was before me. And then down in verse 32, John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. And he was told that the one the Spirit settled on was the one they were looking for. And then verse 34, John says, plainly and clearly, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And so John sets an example for us because his work preparing people for the first coming of Christ is to be our work preparing people for the second coming of Christ to in clear, specific, precise language using scripture, lift up Jesus and turn their attention, not to us, but turn their attention to him who is the savior of the world, the lamb of God who gives the Holy Spirit and who is the son of God, the savior of mankind. Amen. Thank you, Daniel, for that beautiful introduction. My name is Shelley Quinn, and Monday's lesson is the Lamb of God. Why is Jesus called the Lamb? We have to understand the everlasting covenant, and I'm going to just briefly explain that. Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus was the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, grace was predestined before the world ever began. The Godhead, the second person of the Godhead, pledged himself to come down, take on the flesh of a man, and to die on our behalf to satisfy God's justice against sin. Mercy triumphs over justice, as James 2.13 says. So if you think of Jesus as this spotless lamb, the lamb without sin, 1 Peter 1.18 through 20 is scripture you should know in your heart. Peter writes, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But what were you redeemed with? The precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. He was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world 
but was manifest in these last times for you. Don't ever let anyone tell you you are worthless. God puts great worth. We're undeserving mm -hmm. of His grace, but God puts great worth on your life. You are worth nothing less than the price that He paid for you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood is the blood of the everlasting covenant. If we look at Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever." You see, God planned before the foundation of the world. The everlasting covenant was actually introduced in Genesis 3.15 when God spoke to the serpent and said, I will put enmity between your seed and between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and you will bruise his heel. He's going to crush your head. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the goal of the everlasting covenant? It's the great exchange that we find in 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it says that God made Him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us for this purpose, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We are so familiar with Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we should never stop there mm -hmm. because it goes on. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified mm -hmm. right. freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So this everlasting covenant is righteousness by faith. And God introduced it in the garden. He established a sacrificial system that pointed to the spotless Lamb of God who was coming. All Old Testament saints were saved through righteousness by faith and their belief of the coming Messiah. He established this with Abraham in Genesis 15 when he said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to to him is righteousness. But although the religious leaders of Christ's day studied the prophecy, mm -hmm. they twisted the scriptures mm -hmm. and they taught that the Messiah was coming as a reigning, uh, conquering king, a military conqueror who would deliver them. So the goal of John's gospel is to change the preconceived opinion mm -hmm of the day. He wanted people to understand that the Messiah was coming to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament, which included the self-sacrifice in behalf of the world, so that he could renew or reconcile mankind's, humanity's relationship with God. So let's look at John 1:29. And we're going to go through verse 37. The disciples of John the Baptist heard him testify. And he said, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. And what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was very familiar. He just quoted from Isaiah, as you said, but he's he is familiar with Isaiah 53, 7, that says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was as a lamb who was led to the slaughter, as a sheep before its, shear, its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And then he says, this is he of whom I said, mm -hmm. after me comes a man who is preferred before me. Why? Because he was before me. In other words, this is the eternal God. Mm -hmm. I did not know him, 
but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I, John says, have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And then again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So the two disciples heard him speak and they followed him. So. John's statement, I'll read this from our quarterly, the statement of the Baptist regarding Jesus as the Lamb of God supports the purpose of John's gospel, which is to bring about a renewed mm -hmm. understanding of the work mm -hmm. and nature of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Jesus would indeed be the fulfillment of the promise of the sacrificial system that began right there in the Garden of Eden, as soon as sin entered the world. And it says he's going to fulfill the promise of the sacrificial system, going back to the promise of the Redeemer, first given in Genesis 3.15. Jesus said, and it's quoted, John, or Mark quotes him, Mark 10.45, even the Son of Man did not come to serve, mm -hmm. to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And we know that Romans 5, 8 says that while we were yet sinners, God sent his covenant son in the person of Jesus Christ to die for the ungodly. But what is the purpose of his death? 1 Peter 2, 24 says that he, Christ himself, bore our sins mm -hmm. in his own body on the tree for this purpose. Anytime you see that or so that, it's a purpose statement. He didn't die so that we could live like the devil. But Peter says he bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sin, mm -hmm. might live for righteousness yeah. hmm. by whose stripes you are healed. When you think of the spotless lamb that was required in the old sacrificial system, when you think that the sinner had to cut its throat and mm -hmm. then it was offered on the altar, we are all guilty of the death of mm -hmm. Christ, but he died for us that he might justify us freely by the grace of God and that he could give us a new beginning. Behold the Lamb of God who will take away your sins. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. As you can see, we want to do nothing more than to lift up and point to Jesus, which we will continue to do after a short break. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Greg Morconi. I'm so glad you've joined me for today's 3ABN Mission Moment. We've been telling you about Larnetta who stumbled across 3ABN through a divine appointment. Then she connected with Curtis and Paula Aikens and began watching their 3ABN Abundant Living program. When Curtis and Paula invited her to a camp meeting in Huntsville, Alabama, she decided to go. They interviewed her on stage, invited her over for Sabbath dinner, and by the time she got home, they had found a nearby Seventh-day Adventist church for her to attend. How Larnetta longed to have her friends with her on the day of her baptism. And just moments before she was baptized, she spotted Curtis and Paula in the audience. She cried tears of joy. She couldn't believe they would drive all the way from Alabama to attend her baptism. Later, they told her that in all their years of healthy evangelism, she was the very first one they'd ministered to who decided to be baptized. Larnetta says, 3ABN opened the door, and Curtis and Paula said, come on in and make yourself at home. So here I am. Because of you and your support of 3ABN's ministry, people just like Larnetta have found Jesus Christ and the truth in His Word. 
Join me next time for another amazing 3ABN Mission Moment. God is moving in miraculous ways across the earth. God bless you. Welcome back now as we continue looking at the witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. We're moving on to Tuesday's lesson. Amen. Thank you guys so much. My name is Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled The Two Disciples of John. And we're going to basically be picking up right where Shelley left off. And I'm going to go to verse 35 in John chapter 1. And we're going to read through verse, uh, let's see, we're going to probably read through verse 39. And we'll make some comments. And uh, we're going to learn some powerful lessons from this because I really, really enjoyed this particular study. Uh, again, John chapter 1 verse 35 says, Again, the next day John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. I just want to just pause here and just reiterate, we've heard a powerful lesson on this already, so there's no need to necessarily go back and restate what has already been stated. But every great encounter with Christ, every great revival, every amazing change that uh, sparked in a person's life, it occurs because you have behold the Lamb of God. It starts with beholding the Lamb of God. And I just want to make that clear because John, again, as we've learned here, could have said, well, you know, uh, I've got a few more lessons to teach before I turn you over to this guy. But, uh, but John understood that, no, he's here. It is now transition time and he's pausing and he's setting the example example, to look towards Christ himself, to take this moment, to take, to, to, to stand in the presence of his two disciples and say, behold, the Lamb of God. It, it, it's, it's almost a beautiful, in a beautiful sense, him saying, look, at this point, it's now time for you to move on to bigger and better things and beholding the Lamb of God, things are about to get exciting. And so we go continue on in verse 36 and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. So now they're beginning to follow Jesus. Verse 38, then Jesus turned and seeing them following said to them, what do you seek? And I just found this to be interesting because Jesus could have asked them a lot of things, but he turns and says, what is it that you're seeking? And I don't know why, but my mind went to John chapter six, which we'll get there eventually. But Jesus asks a very similar question to these gentlemen who have now followed him all the way around Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. They've come around and now Jesus addresses the fact that these particular people, this group of people who are following him, uh, he says, you do not seek me uh, because of the signs and the things because you really are searching for me, but because your belly was filled. And it just brought my mind to the fact that, you know, we all seek Christ for different reasons. Sometimes we have to do some self-examination and ask ourselves, why is it that we're seeking Christ? Why is it that we're following Christ? What is it that we're getting out of this? Are we looking for handouts? Are we looking for all of the goodies that God can give us, but we're not necessarily seeking the person himself? And so Jesus says, what is it that you seek? You know, what, what do you seek? And I love it says here, they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher. And I love this. Where are you staying? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, what, what neighborhood are you from? What, what house are you going to? And I love Jesus' response here in verse 39. And he says to them, come and see. Yeah. Uh, Jesus could have easily here said, oh, you know, I'm staying over at, you know, 1414 Sycamore Drive, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, Jesus knew at this moment he had an opportunity, a divine appointment in which he was going to be able to spend more time with these gentlemen. And I just want to pause for a moment here and make the point. And we're going to develop this a little bit more over the time that we have here. And that is that Jesus could have told them, oh, you know, I'm over here in this neighborhood. You know, feel free to drop by in the near future at any time. Sometimes God will set up a, an amazing divine appointment for us that he wants us to take time for right then and there. A lot of times we get so caught up in the busyness of life that we put our witnessing, uh, uh, our jo job of witnessing and the amazing opportunities that God has opened for us. We put that on the back burner. We say, oh, I'll tell, talk about that, talk about Jesus with that person another time or, or, oh, there'll be plenty of other times to witness or there'll be plenty more times for me to connect with this person. Jesus did not do that. Uh, he could have easily said, said, oh, I live over here. I live over there. You know, feel free to drop by any time or, hey, let's set up a time in the near future. Jesus said to them, come and see, because Jesus had a motive. 
he understood that these guys were going to follow him. And if you continue reading, it says they came and saw where he was staying. This is verse 39 and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. So about till four o'clock, a couple of hours before the day starts to end. They've spent the majority of the day with Jesus. They've gotten to know him. They've made this connection with him. And of course, because they have now spent some time beholding uh, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, things happen in their life. Immediately, of course, these disciples go on uh, uh, to tell others. They're so excited. And of course, one of these being Andrew, we know uh, that right there in John chapter uh, three, it is, I believe it is John chapter, actually it's John chapter one, verse 41, uh, 42, actually. It says, you are Simon, son, uh, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas. Uh, this is uh, Jesus having an encounter with Peter in which Andrew would have went on and told uh, Peter, his brother, because of his encounter that he had with Jesus after this point. And so uh, this is an, an amazing thing that we have to come to understand that we have opportunities to come to know Christ, to behold Christ, to seek him for the real thing that we should be seeking him for, but are we really making those connections? Are we making the time to really behold him as we can? The entire emphasis, the the, uh, lesson brings out here, the entire emphasis of the gospel of John is to bring to light who Jesus is. When we stop and we realize that that's really what this is all about. Do you really know who he is? Who is Christ to you? Mm-hmm. bringing to light who Jesus is. That's the whole emphasis of the gospel of John so that this good news may be shared with the whole world. And I love the question that the lesson ended with. It says, in what ways has Christ uh, and your faith in Christ changed your life? In what ways has Christ changed your life? Knowing God, this, as I was reflecting on this for many, many years in my ministry, I knew a lot about Christ. Mm-hmm. I was a fan of Jesus Christ. I really didn't know him. I was a fan of Christ, but I was not a follower of Christ. There's a difference. That's are you a fan or are you a follower? These gentlemen here who once followed John, they were followers of John. They weren't necessarily followers of Jesus because Jesus hadn't showed up yet. But when they were beholding the lamb, when finally John told them, behold, the lamb of God, they finally saw who Jesus was. They spent time with him. Uh, It was then at that point that they got to know him. Uh, Are you a fan or are you a follower? Do you just go through the motions? Do you know a lot about him or do you really know who Jesus Christ is? John chapter 17 and verse three, of course, we'll get to this eventually, but it makes it very clear here as Jesus is uh, is on his way to the garden of Gethsemane about to give his life over to, uh, to sacrifice soon. And it says, and this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Luke chapter 24, this reminds me that as these disciples are spending time with Jesus, my mind went back to that story in Luke 24, where again, after Jesus Christ has been resurrected, he has the the encounter with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I just love those words there. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? I can imagine that those two disciples of John, hey, Jesus, where is it that you're staying? Jesus says, come on and see. They're spending time with him. I could imagine, I would love to been a fly on the wall to hear uh, the opening words and and the way that Jesus connected with them and the way that Jesus ministered to their needs at that moment. I I could imagine that indeed their heart did burn within them as they had a personal encounter with Jesus. Have you experienced heartburn lately? Mm. Have you had heartburn for Christ? That's good. Revelation chapter three, verse 20, God is calling out to each and every one of us. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus is saying, come and see. Mm -hmm. Jesus, where are you? He says, come and see. Come spend some time with me. You'll get to know me. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 to 30. uh, The message of Christ is, is so meek and humble. He's simply calling out to all of us and saying, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There was something about this lamb that was different, and these disciples knew it. That's what sparked them to get up from this moment and to go out and share and to tell as many people as possible about him. Come to Jesus. How have you come to Jesus? As I was preparing this lesson, there was a song that kept ringing in my mind. It's actually called Untitled Hymn. And the words are simple but powerful. It says, weak and wounded sinner, lost and left to die. 
Raise your head, for love is passing by. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and live. Amen. And then it says, Now your burdens are lifted and carried far away. And precious blood has washed away the stain. So sing to Jesus. Sing to Jesus. Sing to Jesus and live. Beautiful song, powerful words, but it is true that we can behold him, we can come to him and see exactly what he's all about. Amen. Praise, Amen. Praise, Amen. The Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. Uh, well, I have uh, Wednesday's portion of the lesson. The title is Philip and Nathaniel. My name is John Dinsey, and together you and I are going to go to John chapter 1, verses 43 to 46. This is what the lesson points out. And the question is, what did Philip's message reveal about his faith in Jesus already? Let's go to John chapter 1, verse 43. The following day, Jesus went to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. What an invitation mm -hmm. Philip received, follow me. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't tell us here that he did, but it's obvious that he did because we find out later that he is talking to somebody else about Jesus. And uh, we don't know how much time there is between verse 44 and verse 45, but Philip spent time with Jesus, following Jesus, and was so impressed, was so blessed that he could not contain the joy and blessing. So now we move to verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of of Joseph. I can just see his joy and his uh, uh, excitement as he's talking to Nathaniel, uh, uh, somebody that he wanted to make sure that he also mm. could take time and find out about Jesus. Interestingly enough, Nathaniel's name is the gift of God. What a wonderful name. And this man that has a name, the gift of God, needs to know more about God. So the lesson brings this out. Philip was from Bethsaida, as were Andrew and Peter. He found his friend Nathaniel and told him about Jesus. John the Baptist had called Jesus the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. Andrew had told Peter that he had found the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But Philip calls Jesus the one Moses and the prophets wrote about and adds the name Jesus of Nazareth. His reference to Nazareth sets off a sharp reaction from his friend. Let's take a look at that in John 1, 46. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> now that is somehow, uh, he knows something about Nazareth that he says, Wait a minute, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of there? And Philip doesn't enter into any argument with him about, you know, Nazareth. Oh, okay, that's your opinion, but uh, l l Philip said to him, come and see, yeah. come and see. Now, they go off to see, uh, and I'm glad he went. <laughs> if he had not gone, it would have been terrible because he would have missed out on the blessing of his life. John 1, 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. In the King James Version, it says, in whom there is no guile. And so, question, can Jesus say that about you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Oh, what wonderful thing to hear. And Daniel, that was uh, music to his ears, perhaps, but... Here comes a question, in that, uh, verse 48. Nathanael said to him, how, how do you know me? <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, mm -hmm. I saw you. 
Oh, oh, marvelous, marvelous. This is so much that he's overwhelmed. Uh, now, in Desire of Ages, it says something about this that I, I just love and I want to share with you. It says there in Desire of Ages, page 140, it was enough. The divine spirit that had borne witness to Nathaniel in his, solit in his solitary prayer under the fig tree now spoke to him in the words of Jesus. Though in doubt and yielding somewhat to prejudice, Nathaniel had come to Christ with an honest desire for truth, and now his desire was met. His faith went beyond that of the one who had brought him to Jesus. He answered and said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Wow, what an expression of faith in the words of Jesus that he just, you know, he told them, uh, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile, in whom there is no deceit. Ah, let's go to John 1.50. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? <laughs> you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What a marvelous thing. Uh, now, Nathaniel became one of the followers of Jesus. And Jesus was setting up his church, his followers. Uh, he had several already. This is the foundation of uh, his disciples following him. Uh, now, you know, we need people like Philip today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that uh, will say to people, come and see, mm -hmm. come and see Jesus, come and hear about Jesus, come and know about Jesus. There are people uh, out there today that need some invitation, some encouragement for them to read the scriptures, for them to get to know Jesus better, and we need people to do that. And uh, you know, he didn't give him a Bible study. Well, he gave you a Bible study first before we go to Jesus. No, he said, come and see. Uh, I'm going to read to you now from Desire of Ages, page 141. Philip said to Nathaniel, come and see. He did not ask him to accept another's testimony, but to behold Christ for himself. Now that Jesus has ascended to heaven, his disciples are his representatives among men. That's you and I. And one of the most effective ways of winning souls to Him is in exemplifying His character in our life. Mm -hmm. Our influence upon others depends not so much upon what we say as upon what we are. Men may combat and defy our logic. They may resist our appeals, but a life of disinterested, disinterested love is an argument they cannot Gain not gain say. A consistent life characterized by the meekness of Christ is a power in the world. And so this is why we see the scriptures tell us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. You know, we must understand that we are called to be Christ's representatives. Uh, we see several individuals here. We see this example. This is there for us to understand that we have the responsibility and the joy in bringing others to Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you to become a witness for Jesus. You know, this lesson is talking about witnesses for Jesus. We need to be witnesses for Jesus today. There's so much darkness and corruption in the world that people need to know that there is a better way that there is a Savior. And you know, as that song says, uh, people need the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they're walking about here and there, uh, and they do not know that there's such a wonderful thing mm -hmm. that they need to know, and that is that Jesus has died for them. And we, we heard uh, Romans 5, uh, verse 8, but God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, That's Christ right. died for us. People need to know mm -hmm. that Christ died for us and that He is a great Savior. This is a message that we need to bring to the world. People need to hear about Jesus. People need people like Philip. People uh, need people like Nathaniel uh, that are 
no deceit in their lives, there's no corruption in their life in such a way that they can say, well, wait a minute, why are you talking to me about following Jesus? You live like this and like that. You know, I remember uh, when I was working in this particular place in a bank once, and uh, there was this guy that told everybody, uh, don't talk to me about that, I'm a Christian. And so, <laughs> don't talk to me about that, I'm a Christian. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that turned upon him because uh, eventually, he began to do some things and they said, wait a minute, uh, Daniel, uh, I thought you were a Christian. So we need to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Heavenly Father. So our words and our actions tell about Jesus. But let's be careful. Let us behave as Jesus wants us to behave. Let Jesus enter into our hearts that he may shine through us mm -hmm. and let us be uh, a testimony to lead others to Jesus and say, come and see. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny and Ryan and Shelly and Daniel. What an incredible study. God calls each one of us to be his witnesses. Both of you, um, Pastor Johnny and Ryan, talked about Jesus calling the disciples or some of those disciples. I'm talking about Nicodemus, who was another disciple who was called, but actually, instead of Jesus going to him, he came to Jesus and he came to Jesus by night. We're looking at John 3. So turn with me to John 3, and we have seven takeaways from the witness of Nicodemus. Let's jump right in. John 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership council, like the Supreme Court, you could say, there in Israel. At the time of Jesus, the Sanhedrin consisted of both priests who were primarily Sadducees as well as Pharisees. He was a spiritual leader, was he not, amongst the Jews. Nicodemus is well respected. Verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night, we'll come back to that, and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus was impressed by the signs, by the miracles that he had already seen, by the things he had heard about Jesus. He wanted to become better acquainted with Jesus. You know, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that has that drawing power on us. And Nicodemus was already f experiencing and feeling the drawing power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he came to Jesus. But he still came with some doubt. Takeaway number one, come with your doubts to Jesus. It's okay. Bring them to Jesus. He's afraid. Nicodemus is. He comes by night because he's afraid. He's uncertain. He's doubting, but he still came as he was. You and I don't have to have all the answers to come to Jesus. Amen. We don't have to be perfect to come to Jesus. Come in whatever state and condition you are right now. Let's keep reading verse 3. Jesus answered, said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, the Greek can mean from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now the Pharisees practiced a very strict observance of the law, did they not? They separated themselves from the common people, thinking God is somehow pleased with their behavior. We see this in Luke chapter 18, where the Pharisee and the publican went in to pray, and the Pharisee said, God, I just thank you that I'm not like these other people. So Nicodemus is coming with this impression of himself, this strict observance of the law, thinking he's a good person. And what does Jesus say? You need to be born again. You need to be converted. Takeaway number two, speak the truth in love. Jesus cuts immediately to the heart of the matter. No fluff. No trying to make Nicodemus feel better about himself. There's no social gospel. He points out his sin. You need to be born again. You need to be born from above. You're not good enough on your own. You trying to keep the law perfectly and exactly, that's not going to be enough. Jesus was not afraid to speak the truth and to share the truth with Nicodemus. And how does Nicodemus take it? Verse four, Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He's not understanding at all, is he? What Jesus is really intending. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus reiterates the same thing he's already told Nicodemus, but he kind of expands on it a bit, repeats and enlarge. You need to be born of water and the Spirit. Nicodemus needs the new birth experience. He needs that heart condition. Jesus is really questioning Nicodemus's core beliefs. You see, the Jews believed the Gentiles needed to be converted, but that the Jews were pretty okay. If you look at John chapter 8, you see this interesting exchange. Keep your finger in John 3. We're coming right back. But in John 8, Jesus is talking with the Pharisees again. John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, we read this and we say, Hallelujah! We can be free! But what did the Jews say? In verse 33, the Pharisees answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we will be made free? See, the Jews believed they were the chosen people. They were not in bondage. They were not sinners. They did not need conversion. So Nicodemus is coming with this mindset to Jesus. And Jesus keeps saying, you need to be born from above. You need to be born from water and the spirit. You need a heart change and a conversion. And Nicodemus keeps thinking, but I'm already good, but I'm already a Pharisee, but I'm already a Jew. Why should I be needing this? We're back to John 3, verse 9. Nicodemus answers and says to him, how can these things be? I believe Nicodemus' problem was not a lack of understanding, but it was a reluctance in applying Jesus' words to himself. Sometimes we don't want to look at the truth and we don't want to see what's going on in our own hearts. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said, Are you a teacher in Israel? Do you not know these things? Take away three. Open your mind to accept the truth. Truth is sometimes hard to accept when it goes against our upbringing, when it goes against our culture, when it goes against tradition, when it goes against everything you've been taught in your church or as a young person. In order for Nicodemus to really be born again and to be converted, he had to set aside his preconceived understanding of the law and what he had been taught as a Pharisee. Verse 11, most assuredly I say to you, Jesus is still speaking, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You see, if Nicodemus could not understand a basic concept like conversion, needing to be born again, how could he begin to understand those more complicated religious topics or receive further instruction? Take away four. You and I are to only share what a person is ready to receive. Sometimes I think we push people and we over push people. We try to force feed, as it were, the truth down their throat. Let people grow at their own pace. Understand that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Verse 14, Jesus gives something, an object lesson illustration that Nicodemus would have not only known, but probably taught to other people. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus goes back and gives this same illustration again, that Nicodemus needs to be converted. Look at the Savior as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. Look at Jesus, the Savior on the cross, to, in order to have that eternal life. Take away five. Try new means and new methods to share the truth. Jesus could have said, I already explained it to you. Why are you not getting it, Nicodemus? Instead, he uses an illustration to explain the truth. Jesus often spoke in parables and stories so that people understood the truth he was seeking to share. Takeaway number six, lift up Jesus. Amen. When you witness, lift up Jesus. When Jesus is lifted up, all men will be drawn unto him. Nicodemus pondered that night what Jesus had shared with him. And he didn't publicly acknowledge Jesus, but he studied him. And we're told in the Sanhedrin, he often thwarted the schemes of the priests to destroy Jesus. And when Jesus died and he was truly lifted up, 
Nicodemus remembered the words of Jesus, and he was truly converted. Desire of Ages, page 177. After the Lord's ascension, when the disciples were scattered by persecution, Nicodemus came boldly to the front. He employed his wealth in sustaining the infant church that the Jews had expected would be blotted out at the death of Christ. In the time of peril, he who was so cautious in questioning stood firm as a rock, encouraging the faith of the disciples and furnishing means to carry forward the work of the gospel. He was scorned and persecuted by those who had paid him reverence in other days. He became poor in this world's goods, yet he faltered not in the faith which had its beginning in that night conversation with Jesus. Takeaway number seven, never give up hope. It took Nicodemus a few years until he publicly stood, made, and took his stand for Jesus Christ until he fully surrendered to Jesus. Those people that you are praying for never give up hope because one day they can become a witness for Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill and Pastor Denzi, Ryan and Shelley. You've been doing what the witnesses for Christ the Messiah do, which is to lift up Jesus. So let's take the last few minutes of the program here and just point us back to the themes of Christ as the Messiah. I'm just, my day was the Lamb of God. And I guess one of my favorite scriptures is 1 Peter 1:18 1, and 19, that says, you were not redeemed with worthless things like silver and gold from the, the aimless traditions that you received from your father, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was spotless. And when you accept him as your Savior and Lord, he can make you spot. Amen. Uh, John chapter 1, verse uh, 37 here, excuse me, verse 39, Jesus says, Oh, come and see. And I just want to invite you, come and see. Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I invite you to open your eyes and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Amen. Philip was used by the Lord to call his friend Nathaniel to come and see and learn more about Jesus. I encourage you to spend time with Jesus and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, help others to also come and see. Amen. I'm reminded as I study the life of Christ as revealed in John's Gospel and throughout the Gospels that Jesus uses many different means and methods to reach people. He alone knows the heart of people. He knows what will open their heart to receive the Gospel. So seek Him and ask for His anointing as you reach out as His witness. Amen. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us today. I think that you have seen the common theme shining through here in John 1 and John 3, and that is behold the Lamb of God. Well, in order to behold the Lamb of God, we must come and see, spending time with Jesus. Follow me, Jesus says. Come just as you are, and then let the Son of Man be lifted up just as that, uh, that serpent there in the wilderness. Let Jesus Christ be number one in your life. And I love Ryan's question, which was, in what ways has your life been changed by God? Let him show you, and then you become the witness to share with others. And join us again next week for Lesson number five, which is the testimony of the Samaritans in John chapter four.